Let's turn our Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 1. And we're going to read from verses 1 to 18. The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gad Gadaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Zos Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. 
I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous peace from, with the pagan priests. Those who worship the hosts of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Be silenced in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all shall such as are clothed with foreign apparel. In the same day I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crushing from the hills. Well, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all those who handle money are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall become booty and their houses a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, <clears throat> a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Our, our focus today is uh, on the Zephaniah 1, 14 to 15. That's the key texts. And I want to read those again. The day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As I introduce the subject today, the day of the Lord, I want us to uh, look at uh, um, Zephaniah. Now, if the Hezekiah, named in Zephaniah, uh, chapter one, one I just read, is King Hezekiah, then the prophet Zephaniah was his great, great grandson. His name means Jehovah hides. And so that hiding means to protect. So Jehovah protects. 
and describes God's ministry of protection for his faithful people when the day of his anger arrives. And we read in Zephaniah 2, 3, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Some scholars believe that Zephaniah's parents gave him this name because he was born during the reign of Manasseh in Judah, a time of immorality and sin. Persecution against God's people was so great that perhaps children of righteous people had to be hidden to prevent them from being killed. Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of Josiah. He was a good king, uh, from, reigning from 639 to 608 BC. He had discovered an ancient book in the temple in the 18th year of his reign, 621 BC. And immediately he started a moral and spiritual reform. Zephaniah condemned the sinful practices that were abolished by Josiah's order. And it's generally agreed that he preached prior to 621 BC. So this would make him an early contemporary of Jeremiah, who preached in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. From the preaching of Zephaniah, we learn that God's presence cannot tolerate sin. And as we have been looking over the past few weeks at the minor prophets, we've seen how they came out and boldly preached against sin, calling people to repentance. And here is Zephaniah doing the same thing, showing that God he cannot tolerate sin. And, and although we find a few hopeful passages in Zephaniah's book, the main theme of his book is God's judgment of sin. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2, he declared, I will utterly consume all things from the face of the land, says the Lord. And then Zephaniah starts to list the various groups that must face judgment. We have the humans, animals, birds, and fish who will be cut off, those who engage in idolatrous worship, those who had backslidden, fallen away, those who had never sought the Lord in the first place. All must give an account to God, the God of holiness. Another group was singled out for condemnation and, and, and these were complacent people who did not really believe that God would do anything. Zephaniah characterized them as people who thought the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. In chapters 1 and verse 12, Zephaniah teaches one great lesson, and that is all people, no matter who they are, who are rebelling against God's will, must suffer the consequences of their sin. God has ordained a moral law, and that says sinners will suffer. The law will never be repealed because it's part of God's holy character. The wages of sin are death and always will be. That's the word of God, and God stands by his word. Then we see that God urges people to repent. Zephaniah realized and told the people that God is always available. Though we may be alienated from God and distant from one another, we can be brought close by true repentance. Repentance, either on a national level or an individual one, 
is certainly the safeguard against destruction. So if destruction is coming and the warning is given, all we have to do is truly, sincerely repent and that's a safeguard for us that will withhold, <coughs> hold back destruction. Now, repentance <clears throat> requires self-examination. We must know ourselves through and through, thoroughly. We must be honest with ourselves as we determine where we stand in God's sight. Everything worthless in both our hearts and conduct must be destroyed. If we do not judge ourselves by repenting, we will be judged by God. And you know, any earnest search of our lives will reveal sin. And we must be willing to forsake that sin and follow the Lord. In Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 1, we read, Gather together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. And the phrase gather together indicates a religious assembly and therefore implies that confession of sin should be public. And this is actually in harmony with the New Testament teaching because Jesus said we should confess him publicly. Okay, the question may be asked, why seek the Lord? And there's four purposes for seeking the Lord, which were very relevant in Zephaniah's day and are just as equally important for us today. First of all, we seek God to know him. Jesus said in John 7, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, emphasis is placed on having a heart that knows God. We seek God to enjoy him. See, we must first be reconciled to him. We, we can't rejoice in the Lord until we have accepted Christ's atonement for our sins. And only then can we draw near to God, finding great joy and our souls be satisfied by his blessings. Living in his favour, his loving kindness is meaningful for us. There's no place like that place. We seek God to serve him. Our constant prayer should be the words that the Apostle Paul spoke on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 verse 6. Lord, what do you want me to do? We do not have to wait until we get to heaven to receive our reward for service. Keeping God's commandments and giving ourselves in devotion to him brings us joy. So we have that joy here and now. We seek God to be more like him. As we love God and worship him faithfully, we find ourselves becoming more like him we progressively come to resemble his moral attributes. As we grow in the Christian life, we can become renewed after the image of him who creates us in righteousness and true holiness. To seek the Lord means to become more like him. And as we pause and reflect on our lives, and as we look back from where we're coming from, where we were and where we are to, today. We, many of us can see there's been a change. We've seen a change in our, our character. We've seen a change in our behavior. And we can even confess and say, look, I'm not what I used to be. I know I'm not all that I ought to be, but I can see that the Lord is working on me and, and I'm becoming more and more like him. And I love who I am becoming. And then we see that purity follows repentance. Zephaniah closed his preaching 
with a word of hope. He saw the people returning to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's, it's, it's so tremendous not to lose hope. I don't know what you're going through, but don't lose your hope. And although sin was rife, and although Zephaniah preached, judgment was coming, and he preached repentance, he had this hope. He saw the people returning to the Lord. Judgment had scattered the nation, but he saw Israel restored. He also looked beyond and saw the Gentiles being converted. God would gather for himself a people of pure language. So they, they might call on the name of the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Let's read Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. For then will I restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Purity means a refined character and conversation. Pure language implies a pure life, for the mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart. You know, at the Tower of Babel, the people's tongues were confused because of pride. But then as you look at Pentecost, on the other hand, the people were united as they spoke in other tongues. The only hope for a fragmented world is to be united through a genuine turning to God. And as I conclude, God's day will be a time when he has the final word. To sinners, it will be a day of reckoning. No escape is possible from the penalty that accompanies sin. The day of the Lord will bring an unalterable certainty of the moral law of Galatians 6, verse 7, that a man reaps what he sows. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. On the other hand, for those who turn in repentance, the horrible threat of punishment becomes lost in the wonderful message of God's love. God will break the power of sin, the darkness of the day of the Lord, a day of judgment and terror will give way to the radiant life of his grace as Zephaniah anticipated God's great forgiveness, he shouted, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And we read that in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. I want to I read that again. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Amen. God wins.